session plenary 4 integrating the esg theory into action and for that we have with us mr alexander aronson technical director international valuation standards council mr ross archer director public policy association of international certified professional accountants professor dr colin Colson Thomas, President of the Institute of Management Services, Director General, IOD India, UK and Europe. And for moderate chair and moderator, we have Mr. George Little John, Senior Advisor, Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. I would like to invite you all, uh, and uh, we are here to uh, listen to your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for your very warm welcome here today. We've we've loved the welcome we've had. I've loved the food I've had, which was delicious. And thank you very much. I'm deeply honoured to be here today because we've heard so much about your reputation both in India and here. I was speaking just yesterday um, to someone called Simon Osborne, whom some of you will know, former chief executive of the Corporate Governance Institute, and I could barely stop him during yesterday's session praising you very highly indeed. He was delighted that was coming here today. He apologises. We did ask him to come and speak tomorrow morning, but he's got a, a Corporate Governance Institute duty here, so he couldn't come, so many apologies. Let me just briefly explain the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. We're deeply honoured to be knowledge partners of yours. We were formerly part of the London Stock Exchange, um, the exam department, until 31 years ago, when the exchange itself became a listed company. It was felt inappropriate to have um, an exam department inside a commercial business. So they said goodbye to us, gave us some money, set us up as a charity, and we now have a royal charter. And we have some... Uh, 47,000 members around the world, many in India, which is a very big center for us. We have an office in Mumbai, which we've had for, I guess, 15 years now, and we spend a lot of time there and are, are wonderfully, warmly welcomed. Um, our, mission, our members work in wealth management, in investment banking, and in specialist areas like corporate finance, in investment operations, which explains a lot about our uh, Indian presence, and uh, Islamic finance and a number of other smaller specialized areas. Now, sustainability and ESG has taken up a lot of our time in recent years. Going back to the time we were founded about 30 years ago, um, I met um, a Californian hippie, a young woman who'd worked for CalPERS, the um, Californian State Pension Scheme. And I was at the time a journalist on The Economist. And she had this crazy idea about ethical investing. Um, now, it turned out this Californian hippie, who I shan't name because she's not actually a hippie, she had an MBA from Harvard Business School, um, was very knowledgeable in this field indeed. And we did some work together then about um, how well companies which were environmentally sound, behaved properly in their communities and so on, how they would perform better than other companies. But the truth is we didn't have any numbers to prove this. And as some of the speakers will be explaining today, we still don't really have the numbers to prove this. The data in this area is a big problem. Now, one big issue that we have faced in recent, at the past year, probably in recent months, is about the concept of ESG itself. Um, the, essentially, we all know what ESG is, environmental, social governance. The problem is that trying to put those three together into one measure is a bit like trying to rank your children. Um, which is very di difficult and unwise, because how on earth can we decide that one child is better because of a combined set of values, which might be academic achievement, sporting achievement, general friendliness, taking you out to nice lunches when they get older and so on. It's very, very hard to rank your children equally. It's hard to rank uh, companies. There was a classic example of this about uh, a year ago last month, this month, uh, when S&P, Standard & Poor's, um, decided to change two of the companies in its green uh, finance uh, index. They put Exxon Mobil into the ranking because its expenditure on renewables was going up. Although the truth is Exxon Mobil's expenditure on renewables is a tiny fraction, a tiny, tiny bit of its cash flows. 
Um, but they kicked Elon Musk company Tesla out because of his well-known, publicly known uh, governance issues. Now, some might argue that um, a company which has pioneered electric cars at scale is probably a better company in overall ESG terms, but no ExxonMobil went in. So there is some concern amongst major investors and retail investors in, in the West, certainly, that ESG may no, no longer be the right um, word to use. Increasingly, people are looking at sustainability, but again, sustainability is becoming a wee bit suspect because do we do any of us wake up in the morning and decide that we'll have a sustainable day? Uh, well, we, we try to be. Sometimes we're good, sometimes we're not so good. Sometimes we jump on airplanes and fly around the world when it's not so good. But usually, most of us would probably try to do sustainable things. I've just learned something wonderfully sustainable from Pavani, who was speaking to you on diversity this afternoon, which is how to use LinkedIn electronically to link up with each other. Wherever she is, thank you very much indeed for that bit of technical advice. So there's a bit of paper and business cards that will be saved in future. A very small thing, but we all be behave sustainably in different ways. Impact strikes us as being a more valuable uh, measure of how well we do. Impact investing has taken off enormously in Britain and the States and much of Africa, actually, in the past um, few years as people try to find ways to deliver socially beneficial products in ways which can make profits for investors, but possibly lower profits than they might otherwise make, but investors are willing to accept that. Now, here in Britain, um, we at the CISI, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, were invited a few years ago, four years ago this, this month, um, Invited is not strong enough a word, summoned by a wonderful man called Sir Roger Gifford. Um, sadly, the late Sir Roger Gifford, he died far too young, 18 months ago. Uh, but he is a Scottish banker. I'm Scottish, so I'm prejudiced, but um, a wonderful Scottish banker who ran the branch of Skandinavska in Skilda Bank, in the main Swedish bank in London. Um, he was Lord Mayor about a decade ago, and he was a great campaigner for green finance, and he was very much completely behind the formation of the Green Finance Institute in Britain. And what he did was summon uh, the chief executives of the 20 or so main professional bodies in Britain, the accountants, the, the lawyers, the actuaries, us, CFA, all the others round to talk about working together um, to help with sustainability and green finance. Um, walking in with the chief executive of uh, another body of which I, I was sent along by our chief executive who at the time and if he's watching apologies but our former chief executive was a bit trumpian then about the climate challenge thought it might be fake news that would go away but it, it isn't going away so I was sent along as the resident hippie to um, engage with the green finance movement um, I walked in with the chief executive of a major accountancy body of which I happen to be a member and he and I agreed that getting uh, two professional bodies to agree to work together was straightforward, uh, but three or more, forget it, it's never going to work because professional bodies all work in different ways and we, we, want diff we have different objectives and different uh, long-term plans. Um, but, and Roger Gifford, um, to his great credit during this meeting, realised that and managed to knock heads together. So we now have this very, very effective group now with 14 uh, member organizations with 1.3 and a half, one and a third million members and about the same number of students between us. And now I know in Indian terms, those numbers are tiny, but for Britain, British, these are, these are quite big numbers. So quite large numbers of investment, investment professionals. Um, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, uh, who, was the, who is the UN climate envoy to the COP series, and who was our Prime Minister's advisor on COP26 in Glasgow, came up with the, our sort of mantra, our, our um, mission statement, which was that he said that in his, his launch speech on his path to COP26, he said that in future, every professional financial decision must be made with climate in mind. So in other words, we must all understand why climate is important when we're making our professional decisions. Now, increasingly, Carney, Dr. Carney and others have begun to realise that nature is every bit as important as climate. Um, there's been a very interesting shift in thinking uh, in the financial professional in, profession in the West, certainly since COP15 in Montreal in uh, December last year, which was about biodiversity. And essentially a strong feeling that we have spent a lot of effort 
dealing with climate change in the finance community. Not enough yet, far from enough, but an awful lot of effort thinking about it at least. But we haven't focused on nature. There's a wonderful set of programmes on BBC television that you might have seen by Sir David Attenborough, who's now 97 and still going on like a 27-year-old, a, a very wonderful man. And it's called The Wild Isles, and it's about British nature. And in every single one of the programmes, Sir David warns that um, we are rapidly losing many natural resources. And nature does so much for all of us. We need uh, clean rivers, we need decent skies, we need decent land, which is not polluted, and we're losing it around the world. And there's a very strong and growing force, which is likely to come to a head at COP28 in Dubai this um, uh, November and December, um, suggesting that uh, protecting nature is possibly even more important than the climate challenge, because natural resources, are, the biodiversity is declining certainly in the developed world, very dramatically quickly and very worryingly. And so David has helped enormously just in the past few months in warning people about this. And there's a terrific bit of film which is about to appear in uh, on our website and I hope on other bodies' websites too, which shows um, how this, it, the film is produced by the same people who produced Sir David's film, and it shows how finance can help um, with uh, protecting nature and why finance is a bit of a problem. If I asked you, for instance, um, if let's say the British financial services industry was a country, um, how would it rank in terms of emissions? So in other words, where would it rank in terms of the um, emissions? Would it be in the top 100 of emissions? So that's just the British financial services industry. Anyone for top 100? Probably everyone would say top 100. Is it top 50? In fact, it's number nine. If Britain's financial services industry was a country, we'd be the ninth biggest carbon emitter, which is extraordinary for a business which is theoretically based on electronic communications most of these days. So it's a huge problem uh, for all of us. Uh, I should stop speaking now and um, get to our speakers who are much better, bigger experts than me. But there are some strong linkages, very important linkages between economics generally, and, and particularly inflation and ESG. And Ross Archer from uh, AICPA SEMA um, is going to talk about some of the issues around inflation and how they link with ESG and sustainability matters. Ross is um, the Director of Public Policy and the Global Advocacy Team at AICPA and SEMA, one of the biggest global currency bodies, as you know. He has released reports recently on economic issues like productivity and inflation, a recent one was on tackling the UK productivity puzzle. We all work hard here, but we don't seem to produce as much as we should. Um, and most recently, the cost of business, inflation's impact and the role of finance. And Ross is going to focus today around the broader economic picture facing business and how this can relate to ESG. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Um, so, yeah, as George said, my name is Ross Archer. I'm Director of Public Policy at AICPA and SEMA. I'm going to paint a picture around the economic challenges facing businesses globally uh, and in India. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk through uh, what's happening with inflation, what's likely to happen, the types of inflation, the causes, the links between inflation and ESG and why that's important. And then I'm going to come to an inflation toolkit we've got that also focuses on sustainability at the end. But um, I just want to say a bit more about AICPA and SEMA. We are the uh, world's largest accounting body. We have around uh, 680,000 members worldwide. Um, we have a number of members in India, both on the AICPA and the SEMA side of the house. Um, we have a number of members who are management accountants in India, um, but also we have a growing pipeline of CPAs uh, with exams being undertaken in India now for the first time in the last few years. Um, what I want to focus on is inflation first, paint the economic picture, move on to sustainability and its links. Um, as George mentioned, we did release a report earlier this year on cost of business inflation's impact and the role of the finance. This was a report that looked at both the micro and macro issues around inflation. Um, it looked at it from a finance perspective. What were businesses facing? What was the impacts? How were businesses finding solutions, mitigations to inflation? Um, and that's where sustainability will come in, which I'll come to. Um, they outlined 12 key steps um, to mitigate against inflation. I will list them in a bit, but I will not go into them into detail because uh, I could spend hours on that. Um, 
but it is also a global report. It took lessons from businesses and industry across the globe. Um, so it wasn't just in one jurisdiction, one geography. And what was interesting was all the um, mitigations were universal across the globe. So that they're applicable for any business, any industry, anywhere. You might focus on certain aspects of it more in certain industries or geographies, but, but they were global. Let me move on to economic context. Um, and you're lucky because they've asked me not to have a PowerPoint, so you've not got death by a thousand different pie charts, graphs, line graphs on inflation. Um, so I'm going to paint it very quickly. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to go away anytime soon. And it's a focus for, for all businesses. I don't think there's any businesses that have not felt the impact of inflation in some way, shape or form. Um, and it comes at a time when there's been many different pressures on businesses. Um, in Britain, we've had Brexit. Um, globally, there's been the pandemic. Um, still, I would argue the aftershocks of the financial crisis are still being felt for many businesses, um, particularly if you look at uh, low interest rates in many different geographies for a number of period of time, and that's coming to an end, and that was the cause of, of the uh, financial crisis. And, and also on this, you've got many different moves towards ESG, which are the right moves, but it comes when business is facing a lot of different pressures that some of which are beyond their control. But let me go into some of the figures. Um, Asia on the whole is fairly relatively well compared to the rest of the world on inflation. Um, if you look at India, it doesn't have as high inflation compared to nearby neighbors such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, actually quite a, a big difference. Uh, however, if you compare to China, uh, probably the nearest neighbors and competitors, um, China still has lower inflation in India by, 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 by some proportion. India's inflation is just below 6%, um, and it has not hit double digits for quite a while. So it's, it's actually in quite a, a good position at the moment compared to, to other countries globally. If you look at the inflation forecast, um, towards the end of this year, start of next year, they reckon the inflation will be, and this is economics, will be around 4%, and that will continue around that level to around 2027. Forecasts don't go longer than that at the moment. Um, but with inflation also comes, trying to control inflation comes interest rates as the main monetary policy tool. So where is interest rates in India? Well, baseline interest rates are around 6.5%. Um, they've been rising in India since 2022. At the moment, they're flatlined for quite a few months. Um, what I would say uh, as sort of a, um, an insight, India's um, interest rates and monetary policy action ha has been a lot stronger than certain other countries in the West to try and control inflation. Um, and I think actually part of the report looked at this and, and we took lessons from developing countries and they were actually much better placed in some ways to face inflation as business, um, but also monetary policy, because I think they've been used to it for so much longer. Um, and that was a really important aspect of the report. So what kind of inflation are we facing? What's driving inflation? And this is where the ESG will come, uh, and particularly the, the, the E side of it will come much more into it. Um, there's been challenges and delays with the supply chain due to the pandemic. Rising energy costs, labor and talent shortages, and the Russia-Ukraine war, which has exacerbated inflation but hasn't caused it. And there's three main types of inflation, and I'm not gonna try and give you an economics lecture here. I'm just gonna listen very quickly. There's demand pool inflation where Demand for goods and services rise faster than the supply of those goods and services. There's cost push inflation. This occurs when there is a disruption to supply chain and goods and services and prices are pushed up. And then there's built-in inflation, which usually occurs after demand pull and cost push inflation occur. So what type of inflation are we facing globally? Well, I would argue it started out as cost push inflation. There was a major disruption. The pandemic disrupted supply chains. They haven't been able to keep up with that demand. Demand has still risen and the supply chain hasn't kept up. So then we're, we're in demand poor inflation. I would say we're not in built in inflation anywhere yet, but we're on the precipice. And that means strong economic and monetary policy action needs to be taken. Um, I would argue that looking at India's rates at a very superficial level, it's in a good position. So, what are the mitigations against inflation on a business level? Well, there's, there's sort of 12 actions, and um, I'm just going to list them. And if you want to know more about them, you can read a report. Um, Scenario planning, um, looking at different scenarios for your business, what will work, what won't work, what's the different actions you can take from that. Link to that sensitivity and stress testing, stress, stress testing those scenarios to the nth degree. Cost control and management, supply chain management, contract and debt logs, hedging, uh, efficiency and innovation, being more productive, 
process mapping, product substitution, innovation privacy and forecast and long-term planning. They're all the sort of 12 mitigations that businesses can take and have been taken. But I'm gonna to get to the meat of the issue here around ESG and inflation. So from our focus groups ahead of this research, uh, this was an issue that came up um, and we didn't ask around it, it just came up naturally. Um, one of the things that came up from participants was there's a cost to going sustainable and there's a cost to not going sustainable. Um, business at some point has to bear that cost. But when you've got so many different economic pressures, businesses are finding it difficult to bear that cost right now. And that is going to be part of the reason why inflation and prices stay longer for a little while longer, because there has, there has to be this drive to this, um, sustainability, but it does come at, at an immediate cost. <clears throat> so I want to talk about a, a, a poll that was recently done by Kantar um, across um, a number of different markets in the major markets in the world. Um, and nationally representative samples, looking at consumer behavior related to sustainability. Um, they found that 64% of people globally are wanting to do more and be more mindful of the planet and the environment, but the cost of living prevents them from doing so. So that's where inflation comes in. Um, this sentiment was most prevalent in Brazil uh, and least in China. Um, and it also decreases with age and household size. Um, but sustainability can be part of the solution to um, inflation in certain aspects. If you look at rising energy costs, green energy at the moment is actually a lot cheaper than, than fossil fuel based energy. So energy is going to be rising energy costs can be part of that pro um, problem with inflation at the moment. Going to more green models is actually helping drive down inflation. Um, so. As I said, there's a cost to go in sustainable, but there's a cost to not go in sustainable. And that cost has to be met at some point. Um, but also what sustainability can do in terms of wider economic shocks, not just inflation, is it helps create resilience to weather future economic shocks. If you've got a more sustainable supply chain, you've got uh, more sustainable products coming through, they're much more better future-proof to economic shocks. Inflation is not experienced in a vacuum, and a general sense of risk needs to be resolved, and that's where sustainability can help. Now, I'll close up very briefly. We've also created inflation toolkit. Um, and that contains all the steps and mitigations in more details, talks around different ways businesses can look at inflation, but it also has a sustainability section within that too that looks at how sustainability can be part of your solution and mitigation towards inflation. And one final thought and, 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 and comment is um, accountants are a huge part of this drive to, to ESG. Um, they measure data in companies, they report back on uh, the data in companies and they can offer assurance as well. Um, I think there's been a growing role uh, for finance and for accountants within that. You're seeing your chief finance officer, you're now seeing stuff like chief sustainability officer, and you're seeing those roles being taken up by accountants. And it's because of their skill set in measuring data, providing insights from data, interrogating the data, that's going to be really, really valuable. But I will end there and we'll come on to more on questions. Thank you very much indeed, Ross. Um, so Roger Gifford used to say that bankers will save the world, but I'm an accountant too, and I had to remind them all that you need accountants and, of course, company secretaries to make sure the world is saved properly and with proper governance. Um, can you talk about a wee bit about inflation in the future? I realise this is asking you to look into a crystal ball, which is always very hard indeed, but how will what's going to happen, do you think, in the, in the foreseeable future, i.e. the next month or two, yeah. and how will that impact ESGs? So I think you'll start to see um, so I think you'll start to see inflation start to fall. Um, it won't be in Europe at double digit levels. It will start to come down to sort of seven, eight percent. Um, most countries have a baseline rate of two percent to reach. I don't think we're going to reach there, unfortunately, anytime soon. I think we're, we're probably looking at um, end of twenty twenty four if we're going to get there. Um, I think Indian inflation will be around that four percent figure, and I think actually that's probably a trend that you'll see across the globe is that four to five percent figure. I think because a number of the challenges around inflation haven't been met, it's not just a monetary policy response you need; it's also a fiscal policy response. Um, if you think about supply chains, monetary policy isn't going to change that; it's going to dampen down demand, but it doesn't actually improve supply chains. Um, so there's that, and then also when you look at sustainability. Um, there's those costs that will start to feed through, but they're going to be feeding through at some point anyway. And I think businesses will have to start to get used to living in a 
I'm not going to say a really high inflationary environment, but higher than what we've had since, say, the financial crash. So I think inflation's here to stay. I think businesses will start to gain that experience, that skill set. That's one thing that came out of the report. Um, many businesses haven't faced this kind of levels of inflation since, say, the 1980s. And that skill set's gone from business. But I think, actually, it's going to be built up in businesses now. They have that skill set. Uh, they'll be better faced um, to meet those challenges. Thank you. Now, we, we've all heard of greenwashing, of course, and we might come back to that a little later, but I know there's a session on that tomorrow. But greenflation is, is a new term creeping into our, our language, certainly here. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, so it is a, it is a relatively um, recent concept. Um, and what green inflation is, 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 is um, recognising that the cost of going sustainable does, 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 does feed through into uh, higher costs in, into inflation, but also recognise the cost of not going sustainable also can feed into higher costs. Um, and therefore, um, in inflation, I mean, the green transition is a huge task. It takes massive investments. There's going to be some turbulence along the way, and that's kind of what green fl um, inflation is about. Um, when you're delivering a strong sustainability strategy for businesses, it comes at a cost. Um, green inflation is mainly defined as a sharp rise in the price of materials used to create renewable technologies and energy. Um, and climate change obviously clearly has a huge impact on that. Um, and you can see you can see green inflation with energy prices, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but in Canada last year, for example, there was a drought that caused um, pea prices to double. Um, and that wasn't caused by moves to sustainability. That was caused by moves not to go sustainable. So it's a sort of a double-edged sword. But if you want to drive prices down in the long term, you have to move to ESG and kind of swallow that cost initially. Ross, thank you very much. Unless there are any pressing questions right now, and please do ask if there are. Sir, um, is there a microphone in the room or would you like this one? Uh, I've got one question for you. Uh, inflation was there, inflation is there, inflation will be there, no matter whichever century we goes into. So my question is a look at this country. In the beginning of the year, it was 10.9% or so. Then the prime minister said at the end of the year, it will become 2.3, 2.9, something like that. So we do not know where, of course, we are heading. That is the inflation beat of it. But the reason why cost of living crisis has aggravated is because of the fact that the food prices are up 17.9% in this country and world over. So my question is towards the Ukraine-Russia war, because that will determine whether we'll be able to control the inflation, control the food prices, and control the expenditure part of it, which has corporates, we are all spending. Now, last year also, this country has uh, spent almost 2.3 billion pounds for Ukraine war. Now, what I'm trying to say is that how do you really see the global scenario that this war is nowhere on the side to be resolved? It will go on. How long it will go on? We don't know. Then the question of redevelopment of that country will come. Billions will be invested in those countries. So again, I'm sure it will all come from tax rises, etc. Okay. So what is the global scenario next one or two years you see from the inflation point of view, assuming that this war will go on at least for a year, if not more. Yeah, so I'd say, and thanks for your question, inflation was around four to 5% before the war started. Um, so it was already above that 2% baseline and, and significantly above it. What the war did was just exacerbate that, uh, partly because of food costs, mainly because of energy costs. I think the food now is starting to come through more. Um, I think if you look, look at the energy markets, they're, they're still very high, but they are starting to go down the wholesale costs. Um, and that's the supply chains have been rejigged, reworked. It does take time to feed through. I think you'll see the same in food. Um, I, obviously, Ukraine is a big net exporter of grain and, and other products, but supply chains will start to reroute. Um, luckily, there's still that agreement that grain can come out of Ukraine. Hopefully that holds. I think, sadly, um, you'll want to see the the war resolved in a positive way um, um, for Ukraine, but it's probably going to take time. So, so businesses, 
the wider economic system will have a, will now be pricing in, for want of a better phrase, the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Um, will we get used to it? We'll be rerouting supply chains. That will mean there will be some higher cost, but that initial shock that really spiked it will have gone. But I think it does mean that we're not returning to that 2% figure anytime soon. And I think the latest figures in the UK showed that inflation is going to be here for longer than they last predicted, um, with interest rates settling in around a 3.5% figure uh, for a couple of years. Um, so I think it's going to be one of them things we, 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 we're not, I don't think we're going to go to the age of ultra low interest rates anytime soon again. Um, and I think it's one of them things where inflation is going to be between that two to 5% figure for a number of years for, for different reasons. And obviously the conflict is, is one of them factors. Thank you, Ross. There's one question behind you. There's a gentleman <clears throat> behind you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So as we discuss, and, and in the meantime, Bank of England has revised the rates, and it's now 4.5. So we know inflation is a is a there is a target to reduce the inflation. But my question is on sustainability side or ESG side. The main issue with ESG is that for inflation, we are aware that it's at 10 percent or 11 percent. We know then, and the target we know it's we we have to bring it down to single digit or maybe one or two percent. But in case of ESG or climate risk or, or in, in those practices, there is no standard measure to, to measure where, where do we stand or where are all firms or all industries standing. So my question is, it's open for everyone. It's like, in terms of accounting, are we, are we thinking about global standards which will be used by all firms, all industry to, to measure their preparedness and, and the target for sustainable, sustainability? So thank you. I'm going to let other people come in on this as well, but there is there is that drive to global standards. We would support a global baseline standard, so businesses globally have that baseline they can work from, um, and there is moves towards that. Um, other markets want to do different things, but I think there has to be recognition there's a baseline standard that all businesses work towards. They know where they stand, and then anything extra and additional on that is fine in those markets, but the baseline is really, really important. It's something that we're, we, we're definitely pushing for. Um, I'd, I'd just point you towards the International Sustainability Standards Board, who are sister organization to the International Accounting Standards Board. Um, they've recently in the process of being about to issue two documents that have been in consultation. One is IFRS S1, which is general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information. And the other is IFRS S2. Um, on climate related disclosures. Obviously, it's a movable feast. There's a lot of standards coming around us from different parts of the world and within different countries. And we just have to be aware of these standards and incorporate them into our processes as they come along. And if anyone hasn't seen them, I'd, I'd suggest that you have a look because they will be relevant to you in future. Thank you, and thank you, Alexander. Now, this is very timely because Alexander is going to touch on more general issues here. I'd also suggest a look at the work of the Global Reporting Initiative, which works alongside the International Sustainability Standards Board, and also, very importantly, right now, the work of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, one of these zillions of acronyms that we all have to get used to, TNFD, uh, but, but what they're launching right now by September this year, I think September, um, it's very important indeed in terms of measuring nature-related disclosures, which are even tougher than the ESG measures, but they're getting there. Now, delighted to welcome Alexander, whom you just heard speaking. Alexander uh, Aronson is a chartered surveyor with long and wide-ranging experience in residential asset management and commercial and residential development. Uh, we live quite near each other in London, as it happens. Um, he's also been involved in rating and national and international valuation and investment. He's Director of, in, of uh, Technical Standards at the Valuation International Valuation Standards Council, and he helps the IVSC Standards Review Board and the Tangible Assets Board, so a great expert on valuations uh, with perspective papers, presentations like this one coming, no, no slides, we promise you, and wonderful talks. Alexander, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, namaste. 
to all of you here and all of you online as well. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to the second ICSI conference. Uh, the International Valuation Standards Council um, is honoured to be knowledge partners of yours and to be here today. Um, I come from a different perspective. So first of all, my apologies. I'm not an accountant, I'm a valuer. Um, and from our point of view, environmental, social and governance has increased in importance for valuation profession, because these factors can have significant impact on a company's long term financial performance and risk profile. Environmental factors such as climate change and sustainability can affect a company's cost structure and revenue potential, while social factors such as labor practices and community relations can affect a company's reputation and brand value. Governance factors such as management quality and board composition, which you heard about earlier today, can affect a company's ability to create value for shareholders. The international valuation standards have always included the requirement for the quantification of ESGs within valuation, but this has always previously been on an implicit basis. In the past few years, the explicit quantification of ESGs within the valuation process across all specialisms, and our specialisms include business valuation, financial instruments valuation, intangible assets valuation, and tangible assets valuation, has gained even greater prominence across all markets. And as a result, the explicit quantification of ESGs within the valuation process has become a key topic for us, as not only is it in the global public interest, but it also meets a market need, particularly as more standards and regulations are incorporating specific reporting requirements for the quantification of ESGs within valuation. During the past few years, and I urge you look, to look at our website, um, we published a number of perspective papers on ESG. And our perspective papers are normally um, for market engagement and a precursor to standard setting. We've published a perspective paper on ESG, a framework to asset value creation, which sort of looks at the difference between the different rating agencies. You get different results depending on which rating you choose. ESG and business valuation, and ESG and real estate valuation. We also issued a survey in November of last year to see where the market was at, because we don't write standards for the fun of it. Well, I probably do, to be honest, but we're there to write standards to meet a market need. And we, we went out to firms, investors and valuers to gain an understanding of their consideration of ESG components with valuation. And though the sample size was probably too small to make any definite conclusions, the results seemed to indicate that most firms were in the early stages of ESG identification and consideration for internal purposes. The firms largely relied on internal um, identification, though some had begun to use external specialists to either identify ESG considerations or to assist in the implementation of these considerations. Valuation providers responses came from a mix of individual valuers, small, medium sized firms and multinational organizations, including the big four accountancy firms. The responses were both global and extensive and seemed to indicate that valuation providers were aware of the need to consider ESG in their valuation, but are probably still in very early stages of this journey due to the data challenges that are um, available in the market, because we are still very much in a data gathering process. We're planning to continue the survey on an annual basis, but we've just released our exposure draft, which um, unfortunately I've got to leave here quite quickly afterwards. So we'll stay a bit after the presentation because I've got a number of um, presentations to give on our exposure draft around the world. And we're in a three month consultation. So please join um, and let us know what you think of the standards. But the reason I'm mentioning this 
is we've now included new requirements in both our scope of work in relation to environmental, social and governance factors where a valuer must state any requirements in relation to the consideration of ESG within their terms of engagement. IBS 104 data and inputs now include an appendix on data and inputs related to environmental, social and governance factors. And within it, we state the valuer must be aware of relevant legislation and frameworks in relation to environmental, social and governance factors within their valuation. ESG factors may impact valuations from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. There's not always the data for it. Some of it is qualitative cons um, considerations. And the valuer must consider significant ESG factors. ESG factors can pose risks or opportunities that must be considered where um, applicable. Within our appendix, we provide examples of environmental, social and governance factors, though they're numerous and they're not necessarily the same for all markets. The environmental priorities in India may be different from the UK, may be different from other markets. And when you're talking about social, social for who? In a London concept, in the, in the context of the UK, in the context of Europe, or in the context of the world. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. You need to think about it when you look at it. But we state that a valuer must consider all known or readily available ESG information, which would affect how a market participant would assess the value of an asset and what they would pay for an asset should be included in each valuation. And furthermore, ESG factors in the regulatory environment should be considered in valuations to the extent that they are measurable and would be considered reasonable by a peer applying professional judgment. We've also increased the requirements in relation to documentation and reporting and within valuation reports, valuers must state the environmental, social and governance impact used and considered. But we note that we're in a fast developing field and many new requirements are coming into the market, such as the EU taxonomy or the International Sustainability Standards Board, who are drafting standards for financial reporting. And we're going to continue to discuss and explore ESG requirements for valuers, though our job is not to lead the market but to interpret the market and ensure that any requirements contained within the standard are both practical and possible. So that's just a very brief um, catch up on where we are on ESG in relation to the valuation process. Happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much. Can I ask Chip in a quick question about we spoke earlier about the issues around trying to value your children, how to come up with a unique ESG type measure for your children. How do you rank their attributes? How do you do that in property valuations? Or do you do that? Um, we don't actually have to value our children, though I'm, I'm sure that many investors feel that their assets, um, we, we don't have to actually um, value children in property valuations. It would be quite easy for me because I've only got one child, so um, none of them would get jealous of each other. But um, I'm sure that many investors see the assets that they've invested in as their children. And so joking apart, to a certain extent, many people are looking at their assets. If you're looking at tangible, do they do retrofitting? Do they do retrofitting now to meet ESG requirements? Or are those requirements going to change? Will we move towards a two-tiered market? And these are many of the issues that we are going to be dealing with and looking at over the next few years. But as I've said, it's a fast developing field. I think we're very much in the data gathering exercise at the moment. So for example, in terms of the environmental, I would say that it's largely included in valuations anyway. You look at how green the building is, you look at whether it's in a flood zone, et cetera. I think that in terms of the social and the governance, we're still in gathering the data. And that's what I meant by it's a mix between qualitative and quantitative factors. The last thing we want is people to put their finger in the air and make up a number because that's no good for anyone. Um, and as with all valuations, you have to explain your rationale for what you have done and why you have done it. 
So I hope I, that answers that question and about four others. Sorry, I'm quite... It, no, it does indeed, but that's perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Are there some questions, comments for Alexander? Or would you like to ask them? So, so, can I... Um, let me bring your microphone. I'm a dual purpose speaker. I can do both sides. I'm, I'm very enlightened by your uh, presentation. According to me, ESG is an admixture of uh, uh, ethics, CSR, and governance. Now, there are so many standards for corporates like accounting standards, secretarial standards, and other standards as well. Do you recommend or envisage that ESG standards should be imposed by either SEC or uh, SEBI or uh, other statutory organization? Okay, so um, I actually think that to have full success with ESG standards, it would need to be imposed at government level. From our point of view, if we can show that you can add value to your investment through having ESG compliance, people are more likely to do it than not. Um, I'm not saying that people aren't good hearted, but if you can actually see the numbers improve when you do it, many investors will look at it from that perspective. Um, there are a lot of standards out there. We're having a hard time probably like yourselves keeping up with all the different standards that are out there and trying to work out what, what, what they mean. But I think to be truly effective, it's eventually got to come as government and regulatory level. And I think we're, we're moving towards that process, but it will take time. Thank you. Any other comments and suggestions? questions well alexander thank you very much indeed there'll be time to ask alexander questions afterwards both here and um while he's here uh, after the session it's now my great privilege and honor to introduce professor colin coulson thomas when i arrived here this morning colin was doing another lecture to i think to a group in india which is probably among the list of the many indian organizations of which he's with which he's involved He's Colin's an experienced uh, chairman of award-winning companies and a vision holder of successful transformation programs. He's delivered director board and corporate development activities in over 40 countries. He leads the International Governance Initiative of the Order of St. Lazarus. You must tell us what that is about, Colin, when you stand up. And as president of the Institute of Management Services. He's director general IOD India UK and Europe. He's a very busy man. He's honorary professor at the, Asta, at the Aston India Foundation for Applied Research, distinguished research professor at the Sri Sharada Institute of Indian Management Research, a governing director of SRISIM, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Research Foundation, and visiting professor here in Britain at Lincoln International Business School. Colin, welcome. And you must tell us, please, about the Order of St. Lazarus. Anything that en enables rising from the dead is always welcome in this climate. <laughs> Yes, I, I won't say too much about that organization, but, but it is an international organization. It's been going for, um, in fact, longer than um, the Sri Sim, which has been going for about 1,200 years, coming up for, for sort of two millennia. And, um, and we have activities in a whole range of countries. And, um, and my own activities leading this particular initiative that has actually taken me to over, over 40 countries. So th there's a lot going on there. Thank you, wonderful. But, but in terms of today <laughs> and, um, and ESG integration, I I'm going to talk about it, but also touch on the need for resilience and the impact of strategic risks. Um, environmental, social and governance considerations are interrelated and they should be consistent and complement and reinforce each other. And the challenge for many boards is actually to integrate them. And sustainability and collective survival in the face of shared existential threats could be integrating factors. This year's World Economic Forum Global Risk Report is dominated by interrelated environmental risks. Um, the top three 10-year risks are failure to mitigate climate change, failure of climate change adaptation, and natural disasters and extreme weather events. They're followed by biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse and large-scale involuntary migration. And the nature, scale, and impact of these challenges 
suggest that individual corporate responses may not be sufficient to address existential threats, that collective effort and collaborative responses are required at a time when the world is divided and fragmenting. A collective survival cannot be assumed. And scientific edge of evidence suggests we are not doing enough. Negative externalities persist. Natural capital and rare minerals are being depleted at an alarming rate. Current operations, activities, and lifestyles are basically unsustainable, yet further growth is pursued. Virtual worlds and alternative realities are actively explored while the natural world degrades. And windows for action before existential threats become unstoppable are rapidly diminishing. Our activities and infrastructures must become more resilient. And to confront reality, greater resilience should be a shared aim. We must become more flexible and resilient. We must adapt, respond responsibly to challenges and seize sustainable opportunities. Helping people, organizations and communities to adapt and cope actually represent unprecedented business opportunities. But hitherto, our responses have been too little, too late. Too many people in some countries focus on their self and short-term interests. Sustainability challenges, existential threats, and strategic risks are the consequence of our collective human activity, aspirations, and lifestyles. A board should provide responsible leadership and purpose and priorities that attract, engage, and inspire. Could the shared goal of survival in the face of these existential threats, such as climate change, provide a unifying purpose and priorities? Could UN Sustainable Development Goals engage and inspire? The strategies and investments should be responsible, sustainable, and resilient. And resilience is the ability to cope with and recover from challenges, crises, the unexpected and difficult situations, and also remain operational and viable. It requires vigilance and continuing adaptation to changes in a company's situation, circumstances, and context. Increased connectivity creates greater cyber vulnerability, and cyber financial and other forms of resilience should be stress tested. Could we cope with interruptions to certain supplies or the loss of key customers? Are there vulnerabilities in mission critical processes? Do contractual arrangements lock us in or lack flexibility? Are too many corporate eggs in too few baskets? Rather than specialization and concentration, might diversification reduce risk and increase resilience? What backup or alternatives are available? Are plan Bs in place? Have different scenarios been explored or tested? Multiple suppliers can reduce dependence upon a single source. Should activities be repatriated or reshored and supply chain shortened? Should innovation be risk-led? Risk management should embrace environmental, contextual, and shared risk. Prudent and responsible boards avoid activity and investments in countries with authoritarian regimes and differing geopolitical perspectives, allegiances, and views on the protection of IP. Overall, there should be more focus upon sustainability, addressing existential threats, and enabling collaboration and collective responses. Collaboration can unlock circular economy opportunities. Collaborative advantage 
is actually becoming as important as competitive advantage. And collaborative advantage and trust both depend upon ethics and values. When I qualified as a chartered accountant and chartered secretary, the emphasis was upon integrity. It was the top requirement for board appointments in surveys that I undertook at the time. Boards looked for members and advisors who would exercise independent judgment and do the right thing. More recently, an illegal, unprovoked and brutal invasion of a neighboring country in Europe has been seen by some just as a business opportunity. Company secretaries used to be viewed as a corporate conscience, but today the future of the professions is uncertain. AI applications that have already been mentioned can remain up to date, handle complexity and address regulatory and reporting requirements much more quickly than most professionals. However, they optimize without value judgments. AI and current challenges both raise moral and ethical questions. Maybe values and integrity, again today, could be your differentiators. You could influence action on negative externalities and encourage more responsible, healthier, less stressful and more fulfilling lives and lifestyles. You could help boards to initiate transition and transformation journeys to more sustainable operations, communities and societies. Finally, you can advocate living in harmony with the natural world. And it's interesting that Indian ancient wisdom and that in many other societies really values, reveres nature and the natural world. So in many ways, it's sort of returning to our, to our roots. But above all, we need to live in harmony with the, with the natural world. And there is a world, there is a world out there beyond standards. Thank you, Colin, very uplifting indeed. If you're watching online, please do, if you'd like, make any comments or ask any questions uh, on the, the text box in front of you, and they will come through some miracle of modern technology to the table on my telephone. So please do ask questions. Colin, can I ask you about resilience, how you go about uh, adding to resilience? How can you build it? Because it is so important, as you've rightly said. How can organizations help improve it? Yeah, I, I went through a list of some of the th things that you can do, and obviously it varies for each individual and each organization and each community. Um, but, but most of us and most of our institutions are really sorely lacking in, um, in resilience. You know, it's, it's unbelievable how incredibly vulnerable um, you know, many people and organizations are. You know, we, we talk about you know, inflation and of course, um, you know, to me that's millions of people actually struggling to, to, to pay the bills. You know, the human cost is absolutely horrendous. And, um, you know, and, and to, to, you know, with my involvement with directors and boards over the years, you know, it's absolutely staggering how vulnerable so many companies are. And, um, so, you know, so, so, so each, each group needs to really think about all the things I was saying, you know, how dependent it is on, on particular customers, particular suppliers. Now we saw it, you know, with the interruption to global supply chains. Um, you know, one, one ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal and all around the world, you know, there, there's sort of thousands of organizations falling over. We are, un, we've made ourselves, with the connectivity that we've created, we've made ourselves unbelievably vulnerable. And, uh, you know, most of the experts that I speak to, publicly, they have to keep people's spirits up. But privately, you know, they tell, they, they tell me the game is up. And, unless, we, you know, unless we radically change, and really quickly. Well, there's certainly been doom and gloom. You mentioned artificial intelligence, AI. There's certainly been a lot of doom and gloom in Britain and America in the past 
10 days fortnight about what AI can bring for us. Some of us are hopeful, some of us less hopeful. I'd be interested in views from the, the, the audience here. Any questions or comments on Colin's interesting remarks? So. Sorry, so you talked about the sustainability. I find that today there is a bit of dichotomy because the developing nations, they want to go ahead at any cost, develop themselves, and we can't blame them. On the other hand, the West who has already achieved not only the primary, but even more than you know, the, the, the development share, which they have achieved in the last 50 years, 60 years. <clears throat> For example, in Germany, the coal-fired stations were completely eliminated, but I have read somewhere it is all coming up again. In India, last year, India imported 150 million tons worth of coal because they have to do it because the country has achieved tremendously in terms of power. So there is no power shortage, but then we don't have as many nuclear uh, power stations what we see it in the West. So my question is that, and I believe that the African nations, they're also coming and telling, take, telling India, you take the lead that in the name of climate, et cetera, our growth should not be stalled. Having said that, India is a leader in the International Solar Alliance. We are fully aware of it. So how do you see all these dichotomy and how do you see that it can be dissolved in, in harmony, uh, you know, between the nations without creating much conflict? At the moment, it, it doesn't, well, it certainly isn't being resolved at the moment um, because every year that goes by, um, you know, we fall further behind and the windows of opportunity are narrowing quite dramatically. Um, you know, in countries like India, you know, there's hundreds of millions of people that want to have the lifestyles you know, that people have had in the past that are unsustainable. And, um, and, and what's happened in the past, in terms of past emissions, is history. It's like in last year's, <laughs> it's in last year's annual report, it's gone. And, um, and those emissions are still there, um, you know, fueling global warming. Um, so the danger comes from the marginal activity now, is what we do now, you know, every extra amount that we add threatens to go over any number of tipping points and all around the world, there are endless tipping points after which it becomes uncontrollable. And, and just briefly, George, if I could come back to, to AI, which you're asking about, um, with any technology, the technology itself is neutral. You know, whether it helps us or harms us depends upon what it's supplied to and for what purpose. And, and with AI, you know, the, the thing that, that I see is, is knowing human nature <laughs> is that many of the people that will be the smartest users um, will be people seeking to hack, you know, the, the criminal community. And of course, given the power of AI systems to learn, you know, one, once you're learning ahead of someone else, if the attack is learning ahead of the, of the defenses, then the defences are never going to catch up. You know, to, to quote one example of the dangers that we're facing. Um, but, but as I say, get going back, you know, to, to your original question, um, you know, basically, you know, that the, the, the hope lies in millions of people waking up to what's happening to them. Perhaps the next extreme weather event that affects them personally, because sooner or later, things collapse you know, that the whole communities start get, uh, getting inundated, social order collapses, you know, people just take what they want, where they can, can get it, you know, hundreds of millions of people are on the move. And, you know, whole infrastructures are having to be recreated and moved somewhere else. It's an absolutely massive challenge, but within that, it, it, it's a huge opportunity, because rather than trying to do more, with our existing ways of doing things. You know, we're, we're looking for bright, creative, you know, young people to come up with new, better models. Because you know, there are ways of living that are actually quite healthy, quite satisfying. 
you know, quite fulfilling, quite rewarding, you know, people spending their time doing things that they love that don't involve just burning up rare minerals that will be needed by future generations. You know, it's, it's a, but, but as I say, that the hope is that around the world, people will wake up and change. Yeah, but, but continuing on that, if I may just add, I think what Mr. Mukherjee has said, in a world of 8 billion people, the Western Europe and America is just six, 700 million people, or 800 million people, which have been the privileged few of the past. And I think the whole ESG debate, which I see, shouldn't be come with a concept called something called GD, what carbon emission per, like a GDP per capita or per capita GDP. Shouldn't we come to a concept like that? Because it's a question of price. You can achieve huge amount of, given what you know, the technology is available today, you can be, really lower your, what I call carbon emission. It's a question of price. So shouldn't the rest of the world, the 8 billion people or the 7 billion people or, or 7 and a half billion people of the world who are on the march should have some leeway on that. And I think this whole COP26, COP27 debate, instead of a net zero, should sort of say we should have a GDP target or a per capita target of capture per country. And it doesn't have to be country, you know, 5 million people, country is not a, it's a country because there's a nationhood structure, but regions of the world, the US region, the European region, you can define that. And that sort of becomes a more equitable structure of the world where we are going. Because of what is happening, the whole digital drive for, as what I've seen is kids sitting in Bangladesh or Africa is as smart in doing calculus or STEM as a kid sitting in the UK. So we are coming to a rebalancing world, the world is flat. And, and if you want a more equitable world, we should come to some formats like that, instead of sort of having a net zero target by country, but more of a, based on a population, you should have a per capita measure of, of carbon emission or whatever metrics you want to set. So any comments on that? Yeah, well, well, the world's population we know is sort of out of out of control, and uh, and basically there are too many people um, with the aspirations they have for the planet that we've got. You know, we, we need two or three of our planets, you know, to sustain the, their aspirations, and we're rapidly running out of a lot of um, rare minerals that we'll need. You know, people talk about technologies and everyone having technology, <laughs> and, um, but, but we're desperately short already of many of the things that you need. You know, for the computers that, that so much of today is depended upon may not be available to future generations. And, um, you know, so we need a longer term perspective as well. And, um, and we need to see advancement and going ahead, you know, maybe the world's most advanced society is one that people are actually living quite simply without a lot of the material goods that are manufactured. Uh, you know, because all that process is doing is, is producing um, junk. You know, we're turning valuable natural capital, which will be needed by future generations into, into rubbish, basically. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we're all doing. You know, most of our companies are actually at the end of the day, if you look at the, the, the whole chain, are actually adding to a mound of rubbish. And that's natural capital, you know, that, that future generations will need. So, so, but, but I think you're raising a lot of good questions because you're saying that basically we need to, to rethink this. You know, we cannot just continue with the mechanisms, you know, thinking that we're doing something and con congratulating ourselves when in fact we know every scientific indicator that I look at, you know, from all the authoritative organizations, um, you know, suggests that, you know, we're losing the battle. You know, we're not moving quickly enough. You know, we're not doing enough. Thank you. Some very good questions indeed. And it's, it would be interesting to find out how the questions like that inform the, the progress towards COP28 and making sure something positive comes out of that. Very interesting indeed. Uh, Alexander, you were going to say yeah, something yeah, a little I earlier. Just, I just wanted to add something, but it's probably the perspective of an international standard setter, so my apologies for that. But um, what we're doing is we have a global issue that we're looking at from a national perspective. And actually, that issue is not going to stop. So we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. We're going to look to get the environmental effects 
against the social needs of our society. And that's across all countries. And it is a difficult balancing act. And I don't think people shouldn't be allowed to modernize or move forward, but I think they should be very much aware of the global effect and having that global balance. And that is why standards are needed as an international level, you know, because we either all do it or we don't do it and we suffer the consequences. So I, I just thought I could add that to the conversation that went on. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Alexander. We're all in the business here of knowledge and skills, of trying to improve the knowledge and skills, both people coming into the into our professions um, as they progress through it, and then at board level. Can I ask for thoughts from the audience here about how we can help attract the right talent, help and develop the right talent um, at entry level um, and, and mid level, and also how we can think about we have got to think about talent at board level and mindset at board level. Any thoughts on that from the panel, first of all, on how we how we go about developing the right skills and knowledge and deploying it at high level inside um, uh, organizations? Alexander. Just from a valuation perspective, we, um, I've got to use this one as I'm getting signals over from the corner. Um, from a valuation perspective, it all begins with education. You know, we have a lot of newly qualified people who are coming to our profession all the time. We need to educate them. We need to educate them to make sure that they have the right skills. We may not have to have all the knowledge ourselves, but we will have increasing use of specialists or other organizations, and we will need to be able to interpret the results that the specialists give us. Um, I think that um, it's, it's the responsibility of all our professions to look at the new skills that we need to begin training, making sure new qual newly qualified people have those skills, but also in the continued professional development that many of us probably have to do, we should make sure that we should have the courses and the education available so we can understand what is going on. I mean, just from a construction perspective, the technology is changing so much that I would need a probably full course to understand some of the new materials that can be used just in terms of the construction process. So I would see it all starting from education, bringing it into the qualifications that we have and into the continued professional development. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I'm hugely sympathetic to that. Um, the, the big problem with education, of course, is that, that we do not have time. And, um, and it may be too late by the time this works its way through. Um, I find, you know, if I talk about, um, you know, our IOD India members, <laughs> because obviously I, I meet many of them, and many of them are actually sitting on the boards of, uh, of some of the companies that have the biggest... Um, transformation challenges, and they run them. Um, you know, they're chairing the board or, or they're a chief executive, and life for them is incredibly tough um, because to, you know, to bring about the changes that need to be brought about, um, you know, they're worried about um, the stakeholders. And in most stakeholder groups, some know that we need to change, and rapidly, others resist because they don't see it as in their is in their best interest. Um, so at what point you know, do, you, do you bite the bullet and start doing things? You also know that every year you delay um, the value of a lot of your assets are actually dropping like stones um, because you know, something that maybe you could sell now in a few years time, um, you know, it might, it might be banned, you know, you, you might have to, to get rid of it, it's a far sale. So, you know, so a lot of your existing plant and equipment overnight, you know, it could become worthless. Um, you know, so, so, so there's always that pressure upon you as well. And, um, and there, there are signs of hope, you know, particularly in the younger generation. I, I find, you know, lots of young people are, um, are very switched on. You know, they actually get it because it's their future. You know, for me, I'll be dead in a few years. You know, I, I'm not going to be around for, for very long. So, um, you know, so, so, so maybe I'll be OK. <laughs> and um, I, I won't be sort of inundated with, with a total collapse of everything around me. But the younger generation, you know, if you talk to our students, it's their future. So they actually want 
the future. Um, you know, if I talk to my children, you know, they're worried about their grandchildren, you know, are they, you know, what are they going to get? You know, it's, it's completely unknown at the moment. There could be a whole range of possibilities. Um, you know, so as I say, some people get it. And, um, and if you're on a board, you know, it's a question of um, how, well, you, you, you know what needs to be done. Um, but as a question of getting a, a route map that actually gets you there um, with a minimum of disruption. Because also, you know, if you start closing down in industries and stop things, you know, that's literally wiping people out, you know, destroying their lives, making them redundant. Um, you know, ch ch change doesn't come without cost. It comes with enormous costs. But, but the cost of not changing, you know, is increasingly looking as though it's going to be much more than bearing the cost of the transformation that you need to make. Colin, thank you. And I do hope you stay around for more than a few years, please. Ross. I'll, I'll be very brief, and, and, and the panel's um, mentioned some of it already. I'll try and be hopeful. I think boards are interested in this already. Um, many are having to report integrated reports. I think as we get global standards, they will be even more interested in this because there's the regulation that's coming from that. Um, and that's at a board level. In terms of um, the younger people coming through that Colin mentioned, we're seeing this, that young people are much more interested in the sustainability side than sometimes the finance side. You've got, I mentioned earlier, you've got things like chief sustainability officer or finance and sustainability director. Um, so young people are very much conscious um, of this. And we see that in some of their choices of where they end up as a career, sustainability ESG does play a role in that. So I think um, it's a mixture of sort of carrot and stick. Um, and, 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 and both are going to help drive, drive us towards that and the skills that we inevitably need towards that. And I think you're seeing that more in terms of different apprenticeships are having sustainability models in that in the UK. So it, it's a whole pipeline that's going to come through, but it does take time. Ross, thank you very much indeed. Pavani. Hi. So in terms of uh, retaining talent, we uh, the panel members have expressed um, importance of education, but we are in at that age right now where education is not the paramount importance for the purpose of having um, professionals. For example, NHS this week announced they are looking at a scheme where school leavers can practice as doctors without actually studying a traditional route of medical degree. So we are, I mean, we're moving away from the traditional roots of lawyers having to study um, law and doctors have, have to study, you know, have a medical degree. We're moving away from that, world is changing. Um, yes, education is important, but I would say what is more important is, from my perspective, is um, diversification of resources and skills, uh, where that's where every country is lacking to a large extent, and also inclusivity, because where there is no belongingness, that's when the companies are not retaining, because there is this monotonous job everybody is not interested about. Do you agree with that? Or is there any view about that um, other than education route that there, is, there are ways to retain employees? Um, I, think, I think the points you make are very relevant, but personally, I would rather have my operation done by a qualified surgeon than a school leaver if I had the choice. Um, but yes, we, we do need to think differently about these things. You know, the younger generation may not have a single job. They will have a number of different key projects that they're doing. I can tell you as a parent of a 21 year old, that's quite frightening. I'd rather they just get into a career and go a straight line while I under, well, that I understand. But yes, we, we have to adapt to society. And we also have to adapt to society in ESG. And when I use education, it's education with a big E. You can educate yourself online. You know, you don't necessarily have to go through formal courses or formal things. So I would be supportive of what you're saying. It's, it's part of what's happening. But please let me choose my surgeon and don't let it be a school leaver. Um, can I quickly come in on that? So you sort of raised the sort of the different routes in on education. Um, 
many accountants are now apprentices and they, they, they study for a profession that way. I think the same is in law too now. Um, I'm not so worried about them doing an apprenticeship route for the medical profession because they will still have to pass qualifications. They will just get the under job experience. And actually what we see in the accountancy is sometimes they progress quicker because they have that on the job experience. So they were able to apply it directly. And I think we have to open these new routes up, it gives access to the professions to people who may not otherwise consider it uh, due to all sorts of reasons. Um, and actually it's worked in uh, accountancy. I think it's working in law. I don't know law so well, but I think it's working in law. I can't see any reason why we're working in the medical profession, but also when you link it to sustainability, you're going to have those different routes in so people can start straight away. And I think that's going to really, really help with that sort of skills and talent pipeline. And of course, as, as we go into transition and transformation journeys, of course, we can't think anymore in terms of education consists of preparing people for that, because you don't know where you're going to go. And different groups, different communities will be in different places, because basically the whole thing will need to, to free up. And instead of having sort of a standard way of doing it, we'll need sort of multiple ways of doing it. And, and, and I've always liked, really genuinely liked, the idea of apprenticeships. And I've always liked the idea of exploring. Because when you're born, you come into the world and you've got a natural instinct to explore. As a child, I wanted to do all sorts of things. You know, the moment I got into the education system, for me, it sort of killed most of that stone dead. You know, I was assumed to be an illiterate because I'd rather be down on the beach, you know, with the wildlife than sort of sitting, being taught something that I didn't understand the, the relevance of, you know. So, so, so I, I'm all for what you're talking about. And, and we need that everywhere in place of our existing way of doing things, which of course isn't going to change quickly enough. We're out of time, but can I just tell you briefly about something I heard just yesterday from Save the Children, which is that they are working in Sierra Leone with um, a group of medical educators in Baltimore, and they found technologies using sort of AI, scaled down AI technologies, which can help improve the performance of paramedics in Sierra Leone as an experimental country um, from about 30% of a typical qualified American, newly qualified American medic to about 90% for $50. Now that's a huge transformation of, of available assets. Now, the, the medical pro professional in Sierra Leone at, at that 90% level isn't gonna get, pick up every ailment, but can pick up an awful lot. So as, uh, for primary healthcare, very good indeed, and addresses some of the issues you were raising. So thank you. Listen, we've got one comment from online. So having this kind lady, having found my, sp my glasses, which is very helpful. Let me just read this actually very important comment, which is, the implementation of ESG, according to me, is skewed. There is a widely held feeling that this is loaded against the developing countries as they're about to, fill those, to fulfill those tough emission standards. If those time targets for fulfillment are not feasible, then the countries which have already subscribed to the standards should consider ways and means of making good those shortfalls by way of contributions to those countries who are genuinely constrained, which comes around in a circle to the comment made earlier from the other side of the room. We are out of time. Can I thank all your comments and questions from, thank you for all your comments and questions here, but I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking. Firstly, we would thank you for your welcome to today because it's been absolutely wonderful to be here. So thank you so much. But what a great panel we've had of, of three speakers, Colin, uh, Alexander, and Ross. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.